Okun de na no wa ke se ta de wak ta ge kuma yani un gyast. I am of the eel clan of the mud house of the Onondaga and my name is Guayani. Um, I've lived at Onondaga pretty much all of my life, grew up there, and uh, have raised my family there. And now I'm working at uh, the Nation School. Well, of my mother, I have very few memories. I was brought up by my grandmother, and she was past 60 when uh, I came to her as an infant. So as a result of that, you know, all of her company who came to her house were elderly people, and they spoke only our language. And they spoke not only Onondaga, but they spoke the other languages, Mohawk. My grandfather was Mohawk. They spoke Mohawk and Seneca and Cayuga. And uh, so this is, these are the languages that I grew up in until I went to school. And then I began learning the English language. My grandmother herself had never used English until one of her sons came back from school, the Thomas Indian School. And she used to tell how he was trying to teach her to speak English. And she was reluctant to do it. She said, uh, you know, we don't have to speak English here in our house, but he felt that she should learn to use English because this is what she had to use if she went to the stores or shopping. And um, they didn't do much shopping then. Someone went to the store, I don't know how, how far between visits it was, but I remember she used to sell baskets, she used to make baskets, and she'd have some friends come and help her make baskets. And my uncle used to help with the handles because they were a little bit heavier. But in the fall, she would make sure she had a great big amount of baskets to take to the state fair. Or at holiday and gift giving time, she made sure she had a lot of baskets for sale. And I remember she would buy a great big bag of uh, sugar and flour and staples, you know, that would be needed. And they used to trade maple syrup in a five gallon tin from some people that she used to work with in uh, Pompey Hill, they called it, where I guess when she was younger, they used to take their oxen up there and help with the logging and with the syrup, uh, syrup, uh, produce that they did up there. So she used to still go back there and trade for a five gallon tin. I remember it was a tin uh, of uh, maple syrup. We uh, always had chickens. We always had uh, at least three or four turkeys. And we had always cows, two or three. So we had milk and butter and cheese. I remember cottage cheese tasted so good. Coming, I remember coming home from school and uh, she'd have her butter churn always full of cookies, homemade cookies. And I used to love uh, buttermilk, having cookies and buttermilk. And um, my grandfather would have pumpkin squash or something in the oven that we could snack on. This was an afternoon snack, you know, it'd be cut into cloves, sections, nice and crisp and brown, it used to be so good. Yeah, pretty much self-sufficient. We had apple trees on the land, so, um, but we didn't have nut trees. So as children, we used to go on the side hill to gather hickory nuts and butternuts. And I remember the walnuts, uh, they used to trade for ap uh, apples uh, with the people who lived a couple of houses away. So there was always nuts and fruit and everything in the cellar. 
you know, great big bins. We had potatoes for the whole year, carrots, squashes, beets, cabbage, and everything else that was um, canned. I remember the corn husking. You know, friends and family would gather and do the corn husking, and there was always a, you know, food the women would cook. And also, the kids, we had a lot of fun when it was time for, um, I don't know what you call it in English, probably, like shucking the beans, the dry beans. They would put them in this big, um, uh, the striped ticking that they used to use a long time ago for uh, mattress covers. And, and those kids used to jump on those, and that would separate the the shells from the beans, because the beans were all dry, and, and that was fun. Yeah, they, we had uh, gatherings like that at not only our, my grandmother's house, but you know, they would go to take turns going to other people's houses and helping each other do those things. The men uh, at those times worked, right, the women and men worked together to do all of that, because um, after the braids were made, you know, they were heavy, and the men were the ones who hung them up, <clears throat> hung them over the rafters, I remember, in the corn crib, or on the hooks in there, and uh, as I remember it, you know, they were men and women working together. And in those days, of course, someone had to carry all the water for the cooking that was being done. So they carried the water, made sure the fires were going. Uh, so everybody had their, their work. But it was always people working together, children too. In my time, the men went hunting. When they went into the woods for, to get wood, uh, usually <clears throat> if they saw game, then they would, you know, bring some and uh, but they hunted at night for like coons and um, skunk because our people used a lot of skunk oil for medicinal uses and you had to have quite a bit of uh, skunk I guess to make an, a good amount of the skunk oil I can remember taking that for sore throats and for earaches. And uh, if they went hunting, they went early, very early in the morning, just as it was, you know, breaking light for deer. And uh, they didn't just pick up a gun and go. They prepared themselves for hunting. They would make themselves clean and they would also make sure their mind was clean. I can remember that. My father was not uh, a hunter with uh, a lot of, uh, he didn't go out for deer. He went for small game. But uh, I can remember him saying, my father was with us a lot at my grandmother's, um, saying that you couldn't go out you couldn't just grab your gun and go hunting. And the same with fishing, he said, because um, cause you're taking a life and you have to make sure that you're, you've are you got a clean mind. And um, he used to hunt uh, for both our food and for medicine, but he used to also sell hides there were people who bought the furs, and there was also medicine in the glands of some of the animals. And I'm sorry, I, I don't remember exactly which and what they were, but I remember him preparing that and taking it. He sold uh, some of the meat also, and he had a lot of it, uh, and he sold it to the black community in the city. They were the ones that he 
took rabbits too sometimes, and sometimes raccoon, and sometimes a skunk. But the deer, I remember, was always just for our use, the family and friends. It was always shared. And, you know, in my time, the women did not do the fleshing or the tanning of the hides. It was the men. But I had always heard in earlier times, I guess, that the women had a good uh, share in the work of cleaning and tanning and uh, getting the hides ready to, to be used. Well, the three sisters in our way of life are the the three main um, foods that uh, we have for their, each one of the, uh, of the, what shall I say, of the items within our uh, Thanksgiving have a principal one, like the woodlands have the maple and the fruit and berries have this, we have the strawberry. And of the animals, we have the deer. Among the life-giving foods, these were the corn, beans, and the squash. And in our way again, we are, we believe that they are our sisters in life. The corn, there was a lot of corn raised, different kinds of corn. And I can remember the popcorn was raised in the same field as the white corn, but it was raised in the three last rows of our big corn field. That was always the popcorn. And um, there were several kinds of corn, and there were several kinds of beans. We were just talking about it today, Pete and I. Uh, several kinds of beans that were raised several kinds of squashes and pumpkins. And that was all a part of this harvest, too, was rolling and pulling in the pumpkins, you know. That was fun for the kids. But, uh, and in today's time, ever since I began working at, with the children at the school, I've told them that uh, pumpkins are not for ornament and cutting out their faces just to make, uh, well, Halloween in this season, Halloween uh, uh, lanterns and all. And I said, if you do do that, be sure you use that pumpkin as food also. Afterward, you can still use it as food. But mainly I stress that it's food. It's not something to play with or something, some kind of an amusement. So a lot of the children understand that. And uh, it was always very important that we had pumpkins. Like I said, they were a good staple snack uh, after school when they were baked. And uh, it was just, just a part of life, part of living, that uh, we had the corn, the beans, and the squash. The corn, I can remember coming home from school and uh, there would be this great big pile of corn in the corner where my grandpa's uh, rocking chair used to be. The chair, chair would be moved out, a huge pile of corn there. So we all knew what we were going to be doing that evening, and that was shelling the corn after it was dry. And then this is when we had the stories, and again, our extended family, cousins and uncles came, neighbors, good friends. And uh, the first part of corn that was set aside was the seed. I can remember that. You always put your seed aside first so you have corn to plant next year. And then the second part was the corn that you were going to give away to people who had elder maybe people who didn't plant anymore or for ceremonies or people who might be in need sometime that was set aside and then the last portion was what you were actually going to need and use within your own household I can remember that so well 
there were different uh, burlap bags and kegs. In those days, there were wooden kegs for a lot of things, storage. And um, for those who didn't plant anymore, everybody always planted something, like a small garden near the house, you know, for uh, fresh vegetables. But uh, after a while, there weren't a lot of people who planted great big lots of food, lots of um, corn, and then big lots of beans, and big lots of potatoes. I remember we had, my grandmother had a piece of land, up, what we used to call across the creek. And we used to go in the wagon, all the supplies in the wagon, and we'd go down the road, there was a certain place where there was a crossing where the water wasn't very deep and it was kind of still, so it was a safe crossing part place there. And boy, that was fun. We'd go up there and it seems like we used to spend the day there. And remember, we'd have a big lunch. And we planned, my f people planted the uh, potatoes up there and they planted um, corn up there. Corn they used to plant in several, you know, various places, you know, because of the cross uh, breeding that happens, that you can't plant the same, you know, different kinds of corn in the same lot. So it would be planted in different lots. But that place across the creek had a lot of, a lot of good memories. Well, as a child, I went both to the longhouse and to the church. A lot of people did in those times. And um, I went to the longhouse with my uncles and sometimes my father, mainly with my uncles. Uh, my grandmother's first family were, uh, were longhouse people, her husband. And she was, I was always told that she was a a very good dancer, and that she was a very active participant in a longhouse and a faith keeper. And then she had a family of, I think, five children, and her husband died. I forget now exactly how many years there where she was raising her children, and some of them went away to school. And then she married again, and he was Christian. So by the time I came along, she was Christian. So I went to church with her, but my uncles were still longhouse people, and I went to the longhouse with them. And she never, you know, objected, made any objections to going to the longhouse. She never said anything, you know, against the longhouse. So I grew up sort of in both. And then when I got older, I, uh, I'd go with my uncles, but then I would sit with my neighbors because then I didn't want to sit with the men anymore, you know. And so I went to both until I was in my teen years. When I began making decisions on my own, then I began going to the um, longhouse and missing a lot of church. But it was after I was married that I really committed myself. Well, when I began raising a family, that I really committed myself to the longhouse and realized that I couldn't be going to both, you know. I had to make a decision about one place or the other, and it was the longhouse. And my grandmother was encouraging and happy, and she said, you know, wherever you feel content, and whichever place is uh, helping you, um, in our language, it would be like helping you grow spiritually and making you strong. My mother's mother, who always visited me uh, after her church, they were very Christian, uh, my mother's family. Uh, she used to visit me about every it seemed like every Sunday, every time she came from church anyway. My husband was, uh, he wasn't a steel worker when we were married. Uh, when we were married, he, uh, he was a construction worker. 
And then after we were married, uh, oh, very few, maybe three years, he went into um, the steel, structural steel, and uh, he worked mainly in Syracuse at the beginning. And then sometimes he had to leave and go out of town. Um, and he would come home on the weekend. So this was, it's kind of a seasonal work, you know. And so this is mainly the reason for the travel. There would be more work in the bigger cities and longer jobs. Whereas Syracuse at that time was, was you know, mainly smaller jobs, smaller kinds of construction jobs going on. So he worked both in and around home and also he traveled. And um, as my sons grew up, uh, by this time he was working almost totally out of town because there was more work there and the pay was better. And then as my older sons grew up and he began taking them first during vacation times. And we had a bit of, quite a bit of controversy over that because I felt that uh, my son should look for work around Syracuse or around, you know, home where would they would be home more. But he felt that he should take them with him and uh, so he did. And it wasn't always to my liking. But they began also to get into the steel work, the high steel. And then as they began married and began raising families also, uh, I would talk to them about maybe they should look for work around home so they could stay home more with their families. Well, it affected me in the way that I was, well, being uh, on the high steel, you've always got that little worry in the back of your mind. And I had to, I had to talk to myself a lot about, well, you know, people get hurt in every kind of job. And it wasn't necessarily only the, the steel workers who were getting hurt, although it seemed like when they got hurt, they got hurt worse. That was always in the back of my mind. So uh, with my sons, this carried over, of course. And uh, they began uh, um, to go into other kinds of work also. Uh, but the work around Syracuse at that time was, ve was very slow. I remember one son, the one that you met today, he went into the steam fitters union and he was doing quite well. He went through the apprenticeship and he even did one of the new houses, new homes out on the nation. He was given the liberty to go about and take that job and do it himself. That was quite an accomplishment. But the work wasn't, again, uh, too steady. And the work in the big city was bigger and better in their minds. So they continued, although some of them did change their line of work and began staying home more. My husband did everything. He, uh, he did all kinds of uh, steel work, the structural and the finishing also, which is like putting in the steel uh, framework of windows. He had to do that kind of work when he was at home. They were doing quite a bit of work on the university, I remember. New buildings going up. So, but they were never long, big jobs like in the big city. So this was one reason why he uh, kept going out of town. And he took my boys out of town. So naturally, they took their apprenticeships in in the big city, in Philadelphia mainly. And this is where their union books were. So if they stayed around home a while and didn't find much work, uh, they knew that if they went to Philadelphia, they would have work for sure. They had the benefits 
very good health benefits. And uh, this also was another reason that they kept stayed in, in it, you know. Um, all the way down to my youngest son, who was uh, also, he was in his last year, his last quarter of his apprenticeship, and he he was doing very well. In fact, I was told by one of the union representatives that he was uh, a candidate for being um, the uh, apprentice of the year in his graduating year. And then he was injured. He got a gunshot to his head. He was he stayed home that Monday morning. He was working in Philadelphia, and he had stayed home because he had to renew his driver's license. And so he and his friend, one of his best friends, went out about oh, 6.30 in the morning, a quarter to 7, just breaking light in uh, uh, November, October, the last part of October. And uh, they went out looking for deer. And they had a, they became separated and he had an accident and his friend accidentally shot him. So that was the end of his work on the iron. It was devastating to him and well to all of us really. Uh, because the year before my other son, who had just graduated from uh, the State University was injured in an automobile accident, also a head injury. So it was, it was quite a hard time that we went through, my family and myself, but I had to remind them that, you know, we, life wasn't going to be easy and that we had to be strong and we had to support one another. So uh, they, the boys who continued with the iron work stayed with it. And of course, these two weren't in it anymore. And my, the youngest boy is now back in school. And he's thinking of going into teaching. And he's in, he has, uh, he is legally blind. He has sight. Uh, somewhat in one eye, and but he's he's regained now his fervor, I guess, for living and for doing things. What he has done is uh, adopted a little boy. He, I I think maybe he might not be able to have children himself from the injury, but this little boy brought so much into his life, so much more. Um, desire to have a goal, a future, something to work for. And he is such a precious little boy. So he's uh, now in, back in school, and um, he's thinking of working toward a teaching degree in environmental science. Very active on the nation environmental issues. Well, back to my husband. When he uh, didn't work on the iron, he uh, he did some tree surgery and tree cutting with his uh, brother-in-law, and then later on with by himself. And he took his boys, like when they had no work, he took some of his boys around. And but we always had uh, a good-sized garden. And as he became older, this took up a lot of his time too. And um, and then when my youngest son was in school, I went to work myself uh, in the school. That's when I began working, is when he was in school. During all the rest of the years, I had stayed home uh, raising my family. So at that point, it didn't matter too much whether he worked or not. You know, he worked sort of uh, sort of when he felt like it. And a lot of times, this is kind of funny, he would work f so that he got his 20 weeks in 
so that he would be able to draw his unemployment insurance and do the gardening, or sometimes in the winter he would be home. It was um, a lot of variety in our lives, not only mine, but everyone, you know, in the nation. We enjoy a kind of uh, freedom that I think very few people know, and that one of them is your choice of work. There's nothing that that drives people to just work, work, work to uh, for the sake of gaining um, material things. Uh, and that's pretty much the uh, the lifestyle of our people. Everyone works. Um, because in this day now, you need the money for everything, you know, without all the land to do so much farming and hunting. Or now there's no fishing at all. Uh, everyone has to work, but there are very few who just work for the sake of getting more and more and more of whatever, whatever there is out there to buy. Uh, so our people do enjoy much, much more freedom of spirit, I'll say, in being able to do the things that they enjoy in life and more family things. And within the longhouse especially, we have ceremonies throughout the year which take, you know, a number of days, six days, a lot of them. Uh, so people arrange their work schedules, um, either if their uh, employees are understanding, they will break up their vacation times in order to take time for ceremonies, or some of them will take um, days that they are given within their contracts, you know, for whatever uh, time they want to spend at ceremonies. And then sometimes people have quit their jobs, especially on structural work and construction. There's more freedom for that kind of thing, although you're not too sure about, you know, how you're going to get hired again or where or how soon. But that does uh, occur. People will leave their job if, if they're employed by someone who isn't understanding enough to realize it. This is a time that they need to take off. Well, I was first chosen to replace uh, a faith keeper who passed away in my clan. And this is a process that is uh, done by the people without your knowing it, that they are watching you. You know that they are looking for someone to be replacing, you know, when someone has passed away. They are looking for someone to be replacing that that one. But uh, I was very surprised when I was approached and asked if I would replace a certain elder woman who had passed away. I didn't know if I could do it because when you make that commitment, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of responsibility to it. It's a very privileged and an honorable position when your people ask you to take this and and uh, be, I would say, like an officer in your clan. And uh, so I had to think about it for a while. I didn't just jump into it, you know. I um, I felt that I wanted to be able to live up to my commitment. And so I talked it over with my family. I still had two little boys, uh, and I, uh, so I really had to think about it before I made a decision on that. And they all felt that they understood that this was going to take a lot of my time. Uh, and I explained this. And at first, my husband was agreeable, and he thought it would be fine. He was very good in the home, like helping with the, the chores around the house, raising a family, cooking, 
uh, because I had 10 children, so I, for a long time there, it seemed like I always had a baby or a little one. And he was always good about sharing, helping out with the work in the household. So he thought it would be, you know, he was used to doing that kind of stuff. And many more uh, Indian fathers and husbands do it than people realize. Um, the balance in the workload has always, as long as I can have known, has always been shared in most homes. Until lately, until a few years, when there began this, uh, the phrases of that's woman's work or that's man's work. That's really recent within our people, among our people. So when I finally did agree to take this position, it was after talking with my family and the understanding of the time that it was going to take me away from my family, and it certainly did at first. And I don't know whether it was a trial or what, but it seemed like I had a big load of responsibility. And like I said, I didn't know whether all new faith keepers had to come into this big workload or not, but anyway, it was, was it was that? tremendous. As a faith keeper, uh, your duties are mainly with what uh, is called religion in English. Uh, seeing to it that um, all of the different uh, duties that that come about to have our ceremonies, even to the time of setting the dates for the ceremony. You must meet with the women and designate who is going to do what the duties throughout the ceremonies and meetings with uh, the rest of the clan mothers and faith keepers when there were uh, problems, I'll say, or in times when there were emergencies in families, sickness or death or... Uh, just about anything that can bring about a hard time to a family. Um, you have a duty there to go and to help that family out. And in my older years now, if I can't go myself, then I have to find someone within my family to do it for me, for our clan. Besides learning the speaking that has to be done, practicing it, um, so it did take a bit of time. And then besides fundraising almost all the time for different things, for carrying on ceremonies, for having funds for to help people who are sick, or like fires or any kind of an emergency. So there was always a fundraising that was going on within our community. At a national level, meaning within the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, um, this began while I was raising my children. Um, this began before I became a faith keeper or a clan mother. I was called upon mainly because I knew the language and I could interpret. I was 15, I think, the first time I was asked to take notes at a Grand Council of the Confederacy. And that was because uh, the person who was taking notes became sick, became ill. And uh, I happened to be there. At a very early age, I became very interested in, um, I guess you'd call it the political side of our, of our people. So I happened to be there when he became sick. And they all knew that I, I knew the languages. And so I was very honored. I was very scared, too, uh, at being able to do this, being asked to do this by these chiefs of all the nations. Uh, so I did. And then uh, raising children, there I had children who were involved in, well, everything, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. I was a den mother. And athletics, we always had children in athletic programs. So this took some travel, too, um, with my children. 
So all the while I was raising children, I was involved in everything that was going on. And I guess you might say I, I took a leadership role from the beginning. Uh, well, like most parents or many parents, you know, if your children are involved in something, you're, you're involved too because you want it to be something good for them. You will support them. And this was all from football <laughs> on up, you know. And little league, yeah, when my little when my boys were little, they began playing baseball also. So, you know, it was just it was just a way of life for me to be very involved with my community and my people. So, becoming a faith keeper was just sort of uh extending the role to include uh to be looking out for all my people now in my lung house. And then uh, I was a faith keeper for a few years when there was uh, a need for a clan mother, but it was not my own clan. It was in the Deer clan, and we are sister clans on the same side of the house. And there was no one at the time who was qualified to uh, to take that role. So I was asked by the council, our Onondaga council, if I would sit and if they could borrow me, this the expression, uh, if they could borrow me for that position until such time as there is a person in the Deer Clan to take that position. So again, this took a time before I could make a decision on that. In fact, I even asked of the uh, my clan, Eel clan, if we could be adopted into the Deer clan. I had a large family so that we could all be Deer clan people. Uh, this was after I was a, made a clan mother of the uh, Deer clan. So um, this took a while. And uh, they said no. They didn't want me to take my family out of the ill clan into the deer clan. So, so and so I remain as uh, holding this position. I am borrowed as a deer clan mother. So I, I function as a clan mother for that clan. There aren't many deer clan people at home on the nation. And so this was the reason that I... I felt uh, if my clan could become dear and all my family, and then in that way, you know, there would be more dear clan people. And there would have been. I have over 30 grandchildren, and I have uh, great-grandchildren. But it wasn't to be, I guess. They, they, didn't, they wouldn't allow me anyway. The eel clan wouldn't allow me to, wouldn't release me to another clan. It was in 1971 that I became a faith keeper. It was about 1978. It was in 1978, I believe, when I became uh, uh, the holder of the Deer Clan, borrowed by the Deer Clan. Well, a clan mother has to be able to perpetuate or teach the ways of our long house. And a clan mother is the one, you know, who uh, within our Haudenosaunee, who chooses the candidate for leadership when there is need for a new chief to be raised. And uh, clan mother has to uh, has a very active role, very active part in the ceremonial part of our longhouse. But a clan mother has the additional role of uh, being very involved also on the civic or political side um, of the longhouse. So it's... Uh, it's again having all the role, all the responsibilities of the faith keeper, but then adding on to that the political 
responsibilities. The same as the chief, the same as her chief. In our way, they are the same position. The clan mother is actually the leader of her family. The clan mothers overlook the leadership of the total confederacy. And uh, she also has the role to watch out for her leader, her chief, she say in English, and uh, make sure that he is carrying out his responsibility and to remind him if you, she should see that he is not doing so, not carrying on his job. And then she also has the responsibility of removing one if one doesn't listen to her and, you know, get back uh, into his seat and carry on as he should. The clan mother also has, uh, in the ceremonies, the naming ceremony especially, um, is supposed to, in our language, they say she has a bag of names at her side all the time so that when there, a new baby is born and she has to find a name, she's supposed to be able to reach into that bag and pull out a name for the new babies as they come. <clears throat> and uh, the same as with the faith keeper, she has a bigger responsibility in the, in the area of helping people out because she's supposed to know when people are in need, you know, for different kinds of emergencies or different kinds of needs that people do have from time to time. So that's another big responsibility. And we also, on the political side, have to be at many meetings so that we know what is going on with our nations. So that, again, takes time and sacrifice on the part of the family. You hold the wampum for your leader, whoever you have uh, selected and had installed as a leader. You hold his wampum until such time that if he should pass away, then you have a wampum that you, in my case, would uh, send to the younger brothers, the Cayugas and Anaidas, and this would call them and tell them that, you know, there's need for a condolence to raise a new leader in the place of this one. And then when they come back, they bring the wampum back to you. Wampum to my people is uh, a way in the belts of recording history, recording uh, treaties specifically, but also recording other events in our history. They use the wampum. Wampum is also very significant in our um, longhouse ceremonies as uh, we put our messages and our word into this sacred wampum. And this carries uh, our messages and our thanksgiving to our Creator. That's what it is called in our language. It carries the message to the Creator. And wampum is uh, like a identification for the chief when he is set up as a leader and installed. And uh, I guess in the early, early times, I was always told that while wampum was this to uh, meant this to our people, the uh, the people that they were negotiating with in treaties and such um, realized the value that it had to our people. They realized how much it meant to our people. And so I, th I think that that is how it became um, understood as an exchange of money, because money was the thing that was so sacred, they'll say, and, you know, so much value was um, measured in amounts of money. So I think that that's how that came about. And I remember I went in the 19, I can't remember, 1967 maybe, 
with a delegation of uh, of chiefs to Albany where the wampums were being held. <coughs> and so since that time, there have been, you know, an, a good number of people involved with the regaining of the wampum. Um, some of the representatives of the New York State um, government also, and some people from the uh, from the museums. They are very sacred to our people. They are the feeling when they came back. Um, you would have had to been there to to know it. You know, it's it's hard to describe the elders who came and just ran their hands over them, you know, and with tears in their eyes. And this one lady who was sitting next to me said that ever since she could remember, and she was about 80 years old at the time, ever since she could remember, they had been talking about getting those wampums back. Uh, because they meant so much to our people. They are the, uh, the words, the word of the people, the promise of the people are in those wampum. Uh, and then also on the uh, religious side, they're very meaningful. There have been ceremonies that were conducted which were, you know, lacking and the spirit was just not complete without the wampum. Knowing that they were laying in a cold, dark place and just just being there as if they were something dead and they're not, they're alive to our people. They're something alive because uh, we can't, we can't detach ourselves from the words, from the spirit of those who've gone before us, those who lived in those times when those wampum were put together. <clears throat> because we know that it was heartfelt that, uh, that they were made with a very deep, sacred feeling and spirit. And so when they were brought back after a long, long struggle, and uh, only people who have had to struggle, I guess, all their lives for something which seems to the outside world so, um, oh, I wouldn't say trivial, but they cannot fully understand the sacredness and the importance of it because it's, uh, it's a part of yourself. It's a part of ourselves. It's a part of us. And it was just like a part of our being laying there, being unused, certainly disrespected, and uh, well, it's hard to put it all together without, you know, a whole lot of uh, explaining. But this is the was the feeling of all the people, not just a group of people who felt we should get them back here for whatever reason, for, for uh, the sake of a cause, maybe. Uh, but there was really heartfelt um, meanings to the reasons for having those, bringing those wampums back. And uh, to see those old people, you know, feeling close to them, may, gave it an even deeper meaning and feeling for all who were there. And I think it gave a lot more understanding to, uh, to some of those who were working toward bringing them back, but I think didn't fully understand the depth of uh, spirituality and feeling for those belts and for, uh, for the strings even that came back this last time. But it was also a lot of spiritual uh, strength, a lot of spiritual um, communication that was done on our part, the part of our people, because um, they were very real to us.
even though some people had only had never seen them but only seen pictures of them and some people who had only heard of them because uh we still had people who couldn't read you know and who didn't look at books maybe only at pictures and uh they were still very real to them because uh they had heard the talks they had heard the speaking of the old ones the old old people and the uh and the very strong a uh, relationship the very strong connection to them they were like a part of us like as i said before laying over there unused on um among people who were unfeeling people who had no feeling for them it would be just like a part of your family left out there uncared for unloved unappreciated even we have had them at onondaga for the um when jake thomas came for um the recital of the great law of peace and we have had uh others out at different times and but they were all out at the time that uh, jake thomas came for the tree of peace and i know that the uh the goal is to have a place to bring them to the on the nation so that they would be where people could see them and be even more closely connected but yes to make our children knowledgeable of the wampums is of course um uh very important so uh the uh confederacy had a group of us working on the wording in the passports so they are done in our language and also the english language so that we could uh, be identified and known through the rest of the world well through all the world uh the united states included you know as um as a separate nation of people and not united states citizens as so many people regard us and this was one way of uh of uh shall i say a paper people need papers to to show for everything that they do nowadays when uh a sh- handshake or isn't good enough and people's word isn't good enough and so the paper was made this is how it translate in our language they need a paper to see who we are and so the paper was made the uh passport there are a lot of countries that have except our people have traveled throughout the world and most recently the uh, Iroquois Nationals the cross team went to Japan and just today i issued a passport to a young man who is traveling to new zealand and he traveled with it uh, to new zealand before and his passport had run out so he came and renewed it and i asked him what kind of a time did he have what was his experience and he said he had no problems with it what happens is it some um, if people could understand that they have to do a lot of paperwork with the embassies before they leave this uh country um so that there wouldn't be the time spent when they arrive in another land because it's not you know common and it's not that uh easily recognizable in some countries germany have had a lot of people traveling to with our passport i traveled to switzerland and germany and uh that's it oh no moscow to the uh environmental forum well this was quite an experience uh there were people dignitaries and royalty from all over there at that uh conference and uh 
I delivered one of the keynote speeches. It was very well accepted, and I felt very honored and very scared again. <laughs> but that was really quite an experience meeting so many people who, uh, who had the same thoughts, same things in mind. And indigenous peoples especially, our problems are so much the same. After meeting in smaller in small groups throughout the conference, and getting to know some of the people and talking about the problems of our people, they are so similar. I would say they are the same. <clears throat> the the places and the people are the only difference. I think it was in <laughs> was it ninety one. Oh, or 90, no, it's more, uh, but it was when, when uh, Gorbachev was in power and uh, just before the breakdown of that line in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Republic and also in Germany. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were still in place then then with the old governments than there are now. There was not all the freedom that people have since fought for and regained for their own countries, their own republics. It was um it was quite a time of meeting people striving for independence, freedom of spirit, freedom of Freedom to be who you were born to be, I guess I'd, I would say. Uh, what did I say? I said mainly that uh, we are all a part of this great creation of Creator and that we should not feel ourselves superior to the rest of creation and dominating the rest of creation as was going on all over the world, which was now bringing about um, the uh, pollution that was going on, the usage of the land without any respect for our Mother Earth and for the peoples who uh, originated on the this originated on the various lands throughout the world. These are the least important people in all of the decisions that were going on by the so-called powers that be in the different governments. Uh, the uh, message from our people when ambassadors go out is always the same. <clears throat> and it's acknowledgement Greetings and respect, thanksgiving from our leadership to their, their leadership, whoever they might be, from the women of our nations to their women, from the uh, clan mothers and faith keepers of our nation to whoever the officials, officers, I'll say, in their lands, from the people who have no office but are just um, the working people of our nation to their nations of, our, of people, from the children, from even the babies who are still on their cradle boards to their babies. Within our, uh, our way, it's always a connection, never pulling apart or disconnecting or isolating uh, people spirits, or anything that you can think of in creation, uh, one from the other. So that is our way of connecting with those people. They are humans, just as we are. We all need water. Water is life. And uh, the sun and the moon and the stars, we feel that relationship, family still, our grandmother moon, our mother the earth, our elder brother the sun, 
our grandfathers, the thunders who bring the rain, our brothers, the four-leggeds, the animals, and the birds. Just everything remains connected for our people in, in our ways. And this was part of the message that I took to remind them of this. We could not bring about harm and destruction to any of the items or the subjects within the creation without it falling on ourselves eventually. Um, and those people who are, who have, who are in the technological world, who have made such, in some instances, monstrosities, and who have uh, made such advances in science, could now begin putting their efforts towards correcting and use their technology to make things safe for the earth and all the inhabitants of the earth, reaching also into the universe, the stars, the air, all of this. And it was really a simple little speech, but this is what I tried to put into it, that we are all interdependent on one another, the whole creation. And we as humans are the only ones who cannot give. All we can give is our thanks, our acknowledgement, and our respect. Because every day in our lives, we are taking from all the rest of creation. We take in the air, and we share the air with the rest of creation. We share everything. We all need everything that is there the air, the water, the space, the food. Um, it's so simple, I guess it's hard to understand. For in order to, to sustain our lives, we are taking constantly from the rest of creation, from the plant life, from the waters. We're taking something that's alive, and so we are mandated, or not mandated, dated, that's not really the word. We should feel that we, we, they deserve our acknowledgement, our thanksgiving, and our respect. For if any one of the items within the creation, except humankind, were to cease then all of the rest of creation would suffer and die. We alone could drop out of that cycle, and the rest could go on. We have only brought destruction. And so this was basically the message that I took, that we should try to mend our ways, that we, should, we have knowledgeable people who can do miraculous things with their technology and their scientific knowledge. And they should now strive, <coughs> excuse me, to bring that back together and make a healthy place to live. For their wampum belt to be red. Um, the figures within the belt um, bring to mind to the speaker, um, what the different figures symbolize. And it reminds him of the address that goes as he moves along on the belt. Reminds him of the, the points that are brought out, you know, as he moves along. The figures are reminders to the speaker, like reading a book of what, uh, the different uh, parts of that particular um, time read or say, like in a treaty. And uh, we didn't have treaties only with, um, we didn't have, yeah, treaties 
or belts only among the white men and the in our people, you know. There are belts also among our own people, different peoples uh, here in this land where there were alliance belt, where the, uh, the symbolism or the figures in the belt would remind the speaker of what was said at the uh, time the alliances were made, brought about. Um, there's a lot of repetition within our, uh, our way, and it was designed so, so that it would stay or it would become a part of your thinking, you know. So there was, uh, in the oral tradition, there's a need for all of that repetition so that it, it, your mind absorbs what, whatever it is that is uh, being said or said. And then during the speaking, because of the repetition, you, have, you are allowed the time to understand what is being said. You heard it before, and every time you hear it, you understand it a little bit more. It becomes a little bit more clear. Well, the language is very important because uh, everything that we were given was given in our language. Everything that makes us who we are is, is done in our language, languages. Um, when we translate the messages, uh, there is so much uh, that is lost in a translation that uh, I'm just really amazed at, at the understanding that people can get from translation into English. Uh, but then again, they have to hear it many times again, repeated. Um, and with different people's translations being done, ex different expressions are used and so the the understanding becomes, you know, fuller and wider, more broader, so that uh, it, like I said in the oral tradition, there is a great need for all of that repetition that is done. Our young people need to <clears throat> learn the passages, the addresses, that are given within all of our ceremonies. They're all done in our language. And um, they have to know the meaning of what they are saying, the deep, deep, you know, meanings. Uh, because again, they're not messages that are just said, like you would read a message from a book to a congregation, but they have to come from your spirit your heart, and so the meaning is very, very important. And knowing the language, learning the language is the only way to get the total, the full meaning of the addresses. Everything that was given to us is given in our language. And how can we carry on if we do not have our language, if we do not have young people who are taking up the language and learning these messages, learning the ways. <clears throat> and this, again, is very broad because it concerns everything within our lives. Our, uh, the way we look at things, our outlook on, on life itself, the respect for life itself, and all living things. Women did a lot of uh, the, the work around the village, the community, the family, that today women consider a hardship. The, it's again the understanding that women today would consider a really um, strenuous, too strenuous maybe, uh, 
to be doing. But the understanding again, now from her story, she tells how how the how hard the women worked, and who, and who the Mary Jemison story that you mentioned. But she also, uh, without saying it outright, I believe, uh, had had grown into the understanding that. Um, there was still a balance in the work, even though it, it was not, it is not recognized uh, by uh, people who write about it. Because um, women had a great role in, uh, f at the beginning, uh, giving birth, and then in uh, raising the little ones. There was a time in the life of the little children when they were totally in the care of the women, the nurturing, the formation of that new life as uh, a baby, as little children, was all in the hands of the women. They have um, a separate lodge for the women. The mothers, the grandmothers, the clan mothers were there and they, they taught the young children, boys and girls alike, all about life, how to live from a very young age. They knew foods, they knew how to gather foods, they knew how to take care of one another if someone was sick. They knew medicine because they were taken out with the women to gather this. They knew how to raise the foods because they went with the women when they began the planting, the, the ground was tilled by the men. The women helped. The men um, cleared the land so that the women could, you know, uh, break up the land for, for the planting, but the men helped. There were always men around the uh, community of the settlement or the village who stayed back to help the women. And the women were much more um, physically able at that time to do these things. Their endurance, uh, physical endurance, of men and women and children was much, much greater than we know today. So that things that are considered a hardship today were not necessarily such a hardship to them. Um, their daily lives, just to survive, um, made their bodies strong, made their minds strong. And because they had all that spirituality connected with the work that they were doing, it, the hardship part was, uh, I think, non-existent. If it became too, too hard, too difficult for a woman, there were always men to help. Um, a woman can do or could do anything that she was physically able. And, uh, and so it was until I don't know what, I don't know when in time, um, probably when, when the women came over here and felt that they should sit around and have tea and you know, do those kinds of things, and only men should be out working. Well, you know, even those women, except for the very wealthy, even those women did the work that is considered today many times a hardship. The planting and the gardening were a privilege. They were connected to that Mother Earth, and the feeling, <clears throat> I was always told, was that, you know, you give birth, you plant seeds. Because you are connected to Mother Earth, things will go well. Things will grow bountiful. But there were always those men who did not go out on the hunt, which was very strenuous, who didn't go out cutting without the tools of today, cutting the wood, cutting down the trees for the shelter, 
for their um, for the heat, to heat their lodges, to get the game so that they could have their clothing made, their food, and uh, all of those things that the men uh, had to do. Uh, they were not lazy men. That was not the reason that the women did all these other things. Again, it was a sharing of the workload, but it was a different kind of a mindset to the people. I guess I became aware of it when the women began uh, their search for <laughs> equality. I never felt any kind of uh, the feeling that the women were now expressing, you know, of being treated unequal or being subservient to the male. Uh, I never had that feeling in my life. I never heard about it until I think the the women, the women's lib, libbers began speaking out about their needs, what they felt were their needs. I've spoken at some of these uh, now meetings and I don't know how they took it. I don't think so. everybody was quite satisfied with what they heard because that's just what I told them. A woman is capable of doing, you know, anything that she can. And I told them that it was psychologically, a psychological um, set of ideas that, you know, kept them from doing whatever it was they wanted to do. And that there were individual women who had gone ahead and done it and found out that it was true. Uh, but people didn't take to that those examples. Uh, and it wasn't only the fault of the men. The women enjoyed being pampered, being uh, whatever you might call it, set aside as uh, maybe on pedestals, some of them. But anyway, that state of being, that they were something separate in that way. Uh, and they didn't begin feeling their need for in what they called their independence until they grouped together, you know? It wasn't, uh, like I, well, like I said, there were some individuals who did go ahead and do what they wanted. And they were um, pioneers in their fields. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a common feeling among women that they could do what they wanted to do as long as they were physically able. So I never, never had thoughts about that status of male against female because um, it had always been a balance and I had always been taught that it, it was a balance. Uh, I had always seen that it was a balance, mostly. In our home, in the community, I had, it was like that, you know. There was uh, an equality of people until these women livers became quite prominent in the news and everything. And then some of our people began taking on these notions what notions? That uh, they had to fight to be independent, that they had to really work hard to be able to be and do uh, everything that the men could do. There are some things that uh, women, um, not because of uh, inequality, uh, don't do. And, that, and one of them, which has become very popular the world over and in this country, and that's playing lacrosse or any of those sports or activities that are going to develop, overdevelop muscles that a woman is going to need for childbearing. And we've had uh, some difficult times explaining this to some of the schools in the nearby area that uh, our women don't play lacrosse. And it's quite, I guess it's quite popular 
in the high schools and the colleges for women's lacrosse teams and among our Indian women, well, especially Haudenosaunee, we do not play lacrosse. Because in our ceremonies, it tells us that it was a game from Creator's land for the men and the boys. And so it's just never in our minds to play lacrosse until some of our girls go away to school or happen to be in a school that, that wants the girls to play lacrosse, or the girls themselves, I guess, feel that they want to play lacrosse. And then our Indian girls, some of them who don't know or aren't sure of their ways, have a little problem there. <clears throat> and uh, thankfully, they usually come to one of the clan mothers and in order to get a good understanding of why women don't play lacrosse. And I had two calls from two different girls in the city, one in Syracuse, one closer to home in Nedro, uh, about why she shouldn't be playing lacrosse. She heard that the girls at Lafayette High School, where most of our kids go, weren't allowed to play lacrosse. So I had to explain it to both of them. One of them thanked me and said she was glad that she could now understand why she shouldn't play lacrosse. And the other one said she just plain couldn't understand it. But that's the way it is now. We live in two worlds, actually. The dominant society has um, a set of way, uh, rules, I would say. No, I wouldn't say that. A way of life. And ours have a set of rules within our way of life, which are in so many times contradictory to one another. Our children really have a very difficult time. Those who wish to, you know, remain within our, the guidelines of our way of life. And it's not difficult at all. I tell them that all the time. I can go anywhere in this world and feel comfortable and remain who I am. If there's something there, an activity or something that I know I shouldn't, you know, be involved in, it's no problem for me to say no, excuse me. And I'm not embarrassed, and I don't feel any less a human than they do. And that's one of the goals within <clears throat> our community that were set when we first began bringing the language and culture into the school system to make our, to allow our children to uh, understand and know who they are. I have conversations all the time with young girls. They come to me. And not only me, but other clan mothers, I'm sure, I know, uh, with questions about, you know, a decision that they have to make in their life. And it's good. I'm glad that they know who to come to. I'm glad that they know that there's someone to help. That's one of our responsibilities, too, is to help the young people, or to help anybody, really. Helping one another, doing for one another is one of the one of the prime uh, guidelines in our way of life. <clears throat> so that's just another way of helping our people to remember who they are, to know who they are. And when we uh, began this language and culture in the schools, it was to give them, a, the children, the young people, a security in knowing who they are to feel their, their freedom of spirit or their independence or whatever you want to call it is, is really a, a psychological manner, matter. Um, to not feel inhibited in the presence of, uh, say, an all-male um, or a majority of male uh, workers or people that you must communicate with and get along with every day. To feel that equality and balance 
I think it's very necessary for a person to just um, conduct their lives in a good way, in a peaceful way. Because if you're under that stress of feeling, hey, I'm, you know, they're, they know more, they can do better, that we shouldn't feel inhibited enough or so much that we wouldn't feel, we wouldn't be content to ask for their help when there is something that we cannot do. Uh, it's just a feeling of equality among people. And uh, people write and speak of the superiority of uh, women's role within the Haudenosaunee. And to ourselves, it is never uh, regarded or looked at in that way that we are superior, superior to the rest of uh, the leadership or to anyone, really. We're all of equal stature in the eyes of our Creator. And that's how we must work together. And that's how we must look at uh, things that we have to uh, to resolve within our lives. So if you need the help of someone, we should feel free to ask it. Because we all aren't born you know, knowing everything and knowing how to handle everything. I started to tell you about the role of women when uh, in the ancient times, in uh, the time when there were infants and little children, uh, they were taught by the mothers how to do the gardening, the uh, the uh, preserving of food, the gathering of food, even unto medicine, and preparing that, taking care of one another. And by the time a child was, well, I don't know what, in a number of years, let's say eight or nine, they knew all that they had to know to survive from being taught by the women. And so they were then brought into a collective society. I don't mean that they were isolated all this time, but the majority of their time they were in the care of the women. So in the time when they came out into a uh, the collective society, then it was noted who had special talents. Who is it that sort of uh, just uh, is quicker to recognize medicines, recognize songs, recognize and remember speeches? And then it was, uh, I'll compare it to like a, a tutor, tutorship uh, time of their life. And those who had very special talents, maybe wood carving, or maybe uh, making clothing or beadwork, and then they were allowed the time to hone those special talents and to master whatever it was their talent was. And then there came a time, and the young boys did not go out on the hunt like you read in the stories, this little boy went out with his bow and arrow and he came back with a deer and all the village was so happy. No, they were not until they were physically able. So they learned the singing and the dancing and sewing or whatever it was, their talent. And then there came time for them to go when they were physically able with the men on the more strenuous kinds of responsibilities they had, which called for, you know, a good physical condition, endurance to withstand a lot of the physical uh, stresses, the work that they had to do now. And when they were seen to be able to do this just by, again, their work around the community or the village, then they were allowed to go and they were taught the hunting skills because they didn't go like a few hours out into the woods. They went sometimes for days, weeks, months, 
or the whole winter. And they had to learn then all the physical hardship that it took to survive out in the wilderness with as a man, as a male person with all this added responsibility now.